But when it comes to, you know, regenerative agriculture, it really is about like, you know, encouraging biodiversity, whether it's animals or being in together, not in, not separated and stuff. And, yep. you know, just allowing the different grasses to grow, not having monocrops, not having a monoculture, because that's not how nature works. Yes. So it's really about looking at nature and how does nature work and learning from nature, yes. not destroying nature. Welcome back to season two of Stories of Being. I'm Ingrid and each week I sit down with people who are challenging the way we interact with ourselves, each other and our planet in this ever-changing world. In the first episode of this season, I sit down with Matilda Brown. Matilda Brown spent most of her life and career in the film and television industry, but had a huge change a couple of years ago when she started The Good Farm Shop, regenerative food business with her husband, Scott. In this episode, we talk about that huge transition, the absurdity of our food systems, getting to the root cause of her kind of fatigue and exhaustion, ideology, and so much more. Till's just awesome. She's hilarious. She's passionate. She's knowledgeable. And I just loved having this conversation with her. I also want to thank Daniel Forsyth for my new intro music. My previous intro was a little too whistly. So yeah, thank you so much, Dan, for putting this together. I really hope you enjoy this first episode of the season. And yeah, if you like it, share it, subscribe, do all of that stuff. And yeah, I hope you enjoy. So you've traditionally worked in the film industry. And so just to kind of kick off, I'd really like to kind of hear from you how you went from the film industry to now owning and running your own food business. Good question. (laughs) Big question. Big question, yes. Where do I start? Yeah, so basically, to cut a long story short, grew up in the film industry, both my parents in it, and I went to film school straight after school, uh, did professional screenwriting and then, oh, it's like film and TV and then professional screenwriting, came back to Sydney and spent uh, the next sort of from 23 to sort of 30 working in the film industry as an actor, writer, director. There's so much to love about the industry. Like there's no question that it is a very, it's an addictive kind of space to be in. It's super fun being on set. You meet amazing people. The creative side of it is obviously great. I loved loved writing, loved making films and being in films. But I I think what people don't know about the industry is that there's probably, there's like a 1% of people who can make a proper living out of it. And And the majority of people in the film industry are working other jobs, you know, trying to stay in the industry. It's sort of like a passion project for for people. I sort of managed to survive just being in the industry for, you know, probably since the age of pretty much since I moved back. When I was at film school, I was working in hospitality and I really didn't want to go back to hospitality. So I was really like, I've got to make a a living (laughs) here. But I guess the older, and and I'd been going back and forth to LA and loving that and doing like, you know, going there for pilot season and it, it, that had sort of become my life. Like you spend four, three to four months in LA and then come back and spend the rest of the time in Australia doing auditions and writing and making, you know, at that point I was making my own shows and, and then back to LA for, you looked like you had a question there. Didn't no, 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 I was just thinking it sounds like it's intense. Yeah, it is intense. you got to like, I mean, I don't know how other people feel about it, but certainly you have to summon a lot to pick yourself up and go back to LA and like, okay, I've got to be, it's pilot season. Like there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of sitting around. It's not just like audition after audition after audition. There's a lot of like going to lunches with people and dinners and the Chateau Marmont and like lots of glamorous stuff that you're doing and wasting a lot of money. Yeah. But then it's also like like my first year of going to LA was probably my best because it was when I got closest to getting a pretty big job. But it was like that's when you meet, you do all your meetings and you meet, you go to, you, you, you know, you, you, you lined up, my Australian agent lined me up with, you know, a handful of these the, these are the managers that you're going to go and meet and then these are the agents that you're going to go and meet so you're you're doing like you know pretty big meetings like walking down 
you know, streets that you've seen in movies your whole life. Yes. And it was this, like, 25-year-old girl going, oh, God, I'm going to go into this big building and go up there and meet these people who rep the Hemsworths. And, like, yeah, right. Terrifying. Yes. Basically that. So, yeah, so I've been doing that for the sort of four, you know, three, four to five years, I guess. And then and then I got – so I had I had an agent, I had a uh, manager over in the States, and, and then I got a writing agent a pretty big writing agent over in the States with a company called Paradigm. And my agent wanted me to write a pilot and come over and pitch it. And we, he was like, write a pilot and we'll come over here and, you know, we'll go around we'll pitch it. I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> right, I'll just pull just, out a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I did. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. And sat down, just did not <laughs> get up until I'd written a pilot. <laughs> Took me... It took me like a month to write the first draft of a of a pilot called All My Exes and he loved it and I got really good feedback on it and then I wrote the second pilot. So I went over there with two – it's not second pilot, second episode. Went over there with two eps, saw a bunch of people, got really close to getting it made. Right. And this was sort of like the beginning, the tipping point, sort of like where it started to get to the point with all of this where I was thinking – Oh my god! Like, how many auditions do I have to do? How many meetings do I have to take? How many rejections do I have to have before I land the job that catapults me into a place where I, you know, it's it's smoother sailing. Like, it's I'm I'm sure there's n- I really believe there's no one out there who's not working their ass off. Yeah. But yeah, it, it did get to the point where I was like, oh, this is this is getting tiring. Yes. Where is my career going? how am I going to make a living, proper living from this? And I'd never really been someone who cared about money, but I was like, I want a family and I want to contribute. Yes. So anyway, I got really close to that and then it didn't happen. Like I came back to Australia and um, the deals were being made. Like even when I was on the plane, I was like, I'll probably get off the plane and I'll have my contract. Got off the plane, contract wasn't there, and then waited for a few days. And then it, then it basically got to the point where my agent was like, look, I don't know what's happened. They've just gone cold. Right. And that was like another thing that I really struggled with in the industry was that people just go cold. They don't tell you why. They just kind of go away. Yeah, that's The job hard. just goes away and it goes to someone else or something else comes along that they want to do more or whatever and that's fine but it's so hard time and time again. So anyway, that, that one went away and it was heartbreaking because mm. I'd put, put everything into it. And I was like, oh, I don't know how, how I, I don't know if I can keep doing this. And I was just kind of falling out of love with it. And then it got really close, got picked up here, and got optioned here by Fremantle. And I had a producer attached to it who was the producer of Offspring and she was loved it. And it was, well, again, it was like ready to go. <laughs> Channel 10 wanted to make it. And then, and then of course it went away. Yeah. And so that, that for me was like, that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. And at that point I was 30. I'd just met Scott. I knew I wanted to have a baby pretty soon. And I didn't, like, say I'm stepping out of the industry. I mean, I've still got my agents now. Mm. But I kind of opened the door to other possibilities. I mean, I certainly took time out as a mum. You know, the kind of blessing for me was that after that I got pregnant pretty straight away. Yeah. And I was able to kind of go, okay, well, this is the break that I need. And I sort of stopped auditioning and stopped doing all that and had kind of, you know, had the baby and then had like a good amount of time where I was just like felt free from it. Yes. Yeah. And then slowly <laughs> turning into the entire podcast. <laughs> cut, cut, no, cut. No, but it's good, con- like, because it, it, it sounds like as amazing as it is, also such a burden in many ways of like always just waiting for the yeah. next thing and the break yeah. and, you know. The lack of control is hard, that you're always yes. at the whim of someone else's decision. Yes. And when you have your own business, you don't have that. You are the decision maker. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, I love about our having a business. I mean, I mm. feel like it's super creative. <sighs> I've jumped straight past everything straight into it. Yeah, fine, they fine. That's okay. <laughs> Unless there's things that are yeah, important leading up to it, but it doesn't matter. No, um, I could talk forever. <laughs> but I won't. What's Scott thinking? <laughs> so anyway, basically what happened was that then also I had a baby and I suddenly felt, I suddenly felt 
like I had more of a responsibility to be doing something like, you know, not that the arts isn't important, it's hugely important, but uh, I wasn't particularly, I wasn't really doing enough in that space. Mm. And so I really felt like I wanted to do something and I'm not good with just sitting idle. I don't want to sit idle. I want to work. I'm creative. I constantly want to be like contributing in some way. Mm -hmm. So it had just so happened that mum had been regenerating the farm, our family farm, um, which had been conventionally farmed for ever since mum and dad bought it before I was born. And what I had been, we'd been hearing, you know, all of the stuff about, um, regenerative farming and mum been talking about it a lot but we hadn't really been paying attention and then one Christmas we spent quite a bit of time up there and suddenly it it all sort of clicked about you know the difference between conventional farming and regenerative farming and the different things that she'd been working with the farmer on to regenerate the land and the less inputs they'd been using and you know all this stuff it just started to make sense and suddenly, and I was also a vegan for a big chunk of my 20s, so yeah. because I'd watched all those documentaries and didn't want to contribute to that that system of farming and and where animals weren't getting a good life, mm. uh, but any life. Yeah. Um, and so, but since meeting Scott, I wasn't vegan anymore. I wasn't vegetarian anymore. He had always, he, he's always been really food provenance has always been a big part of his health journey. And as a nutritionist, he's always, he's always prioritized food Mm. and good quality food. So he'd always been, you know, he'd always known, known where to source his meat from ethically. Um, Whereas I didn't know that was a thing. Yes. So I just cut it out altogether. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it wasn't, it's not, I don't have a problem with an animal dying Mm. to eat it. Like that happens in the animal kingdom yes, <laughs> across yeah. the board. I don't yeah. have a problem with that. It's the life that they have that I always had a problem with. Yes. And so I knew that the cows on our farm were having a really nice life. Mm. And I knew that the farm was being taken care of. The land was being taken care of. It, it was it's working with nature, not against it, using very, very low to, to zero chemical inputs. We wanted to be eating that meat. <laughs> so... That was the start of the good farm shop. Yeah, was how do we get that cow on our plate and eat that because we want to be eating regeneratively, regeneratively farmed. And I'd gone to my butcher and he didn't know what that was and he didn't know he didn't really, you know, I, I sort of had said like, do you know any Isn't of the that? farms that you source from? And this was like during COVID and there were lines out in the door. He didn't want to have a conversation. He's like, now's not the time. He's like, choose your steak, lady, <laughs> yeah, and get exactly. out. But that's pretty interesting that even the butcher didn't know. But so it's, it's I didn't know. I still was under the impression that butchers bought whole animals and they hang, hang them out the back and cut them up. But that is just so far from where, what most butchers do. Right. Most butchers buying crates of cuts right. from an abattoir. I, I didn't an know abattoirs. that. Okay. Oh yeah, no, you wouldn't. You will not. Any butcher that you walk into, there will not be bodies hanging in yeah, the back right, of their of in their cool not. room. Yeah, unless yeah. they're unless they're a whole animal butchery, yes. which very few are. Yeah, and they hang their hat on that. When they are, you'll know yes. because it's it's quite a thing to be doing that these days because it's not cheap to do to buy whole bodies from farms. Yes, so very few butchers know where they're meat comes from it's really hard to trace your meat because you they get crates of cuts from abattoirs and abattoirs get a huge amount of farms and feedlots delivering to their abattoir and then they get disseminated yes in so like the problem is that you know i feel it's fly out the door yes and in that's this is why they people don't buy whole bodies is because it's really hard to kind of divvy up that whole body yes because i, I there's like six eye fillets on a cow they yeah, would fly out yeah. then you need more eye fillets yes. so you can't buy a whole nother body just to get more yes so it's a it's a bit of a thing where like the consumer doesn't really understand we're so far away from you know where we used to be with buying animals direct from farms yeah and the local butcher butchering yeah. them and selling them yeah like i went to my local butcher at maxfield the other day where our farm is mm. Not the other day. This is a couple of years ago when I was deep, kind of into this. Like, hmm, I wonder if the local butcher has any local meat. <laughs> I'm going to go and ask him. <laughs> I walked in and was like, "Do you have any meat from the farms around here?" <laughs> he was like, "Oh God, no." 
like just flat out. No, 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 no. These would come from like probably like south coast right. or something or, you know, way up in the, you know, Queensland. I was like, oh, wow, that, this is a this is the country. There's yes. cows in every paddock that yes. you, you know, it was, I was just sort of like, it was just a dawning on me. I was like, wow, we're really amazing that you can't get a steak from the farm across the road. Yes, and, and consumers I are often totally removed, but for mm. the butcher to be so removed from it mm. is like a really – I've never actually thought about that, or mm. like that middleman being so removed as well mm. when it's like a butcher, like a mm. local butcher. You would just assume that they're getting it from the local yeah. farms. Yeah, no. <laughs> which is crazy. And so you mentioned regenerative farming before. What – what do you say regenerative farming compared to like conventional mm. industrial really farming? Mm. What does regenerative farming do and how does it work compared to like a, you know, industrial farming? So regenerative farming basically is like leaving the land better than how you found it. So working with nature, not against it. So in conventional farming, what often happens is you spray the ground to grow the crops that the animals eat and you spray them with you know fertilizer and urea and other synthetic chemicals that continually produce the crops but what happens is the soil gets really degraded and soil is the most important thing in (laughs) in farming yes and that's kind of the problem now is we've got ourselves into a situation with conventional uh, conventional and industrial farming where the, the soil is so degraded that you need more inputs to grow to grow it to grow these crops and then the more inputs you put on it more the soil gets degraded and so conventional farming i mean re- regenerative farming is just that's how we used to farm we just didn't uh-huh. used to put chemical inputs on it and it it and the soil was took care of it 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 knew how to grow the crops yes. to feed the animals and then so that's sort of the main thing about the difference between conventional farming and regenerative farming but regenerative farming also has like a set of principles that depending on whether you're you know growing cows or beef or you're you know a lettuce a vegetable farm or whatever say for example if you're if you've got beef on your farm and you're farming regeneratively you might be doing things like cell grazing so it sort of mimics this sort of mimics nature um, and one of the pioneers of regenerative farming, uh, Alan Savory, was one of the first people to sort of understand how in, because in Africa, the bison, um, they, would, they move in sort of f- very close together. They all stay very close together and they don't overgraze because they're mm. constantly having to move because they've got, pre- you know, they stay in this close sort of knit group because they've got predators coming at them. And so it's it sort of mimics and they and they and in that way they're always moving because also they're always shitting and you don't eat your shit. Yeah. <laughs> so they're moving constantly to get the new grass. So they're not overgrazing ever. And the biggest problem is overgrazing because it, it when you don't overgraze and you just mow the top of the grass, it keeps the grass in a state of photosynthesis and then it can continue to grow. But once it gets to a point where it's mowed down, it's really hard to grow the grass back. Yes. And so regenerative farmers, they kind of mimic that way and they they keep the herd close together in smaller, smaller kind of paddocks. So they often sort of like divide their big paddocks into smaller paddocks and then they move them often so that the cows don't overgraze the grass. Yes. And that's called cell grazing. So that's one of the principles of regenerative agriculture. And then cover crops is another because you don't want your soil to be exposed. Otherwise it, it degrades the soil. Um, and so they, they often plant kind of cover crops. Uh, it keeps the soil moist and fertile. And there's and there's lots of others. I don't want to bore people <laughs> with it, but it's it is actually really interesting. Like you can go down, you know, you can go down a, a nice little rabbit hole yes. into into you know the different types of farming and and regen is just sort of an umbrella for like you know those things like biodynamic farming and yes. or, you know organic would be under there. But but when it comes to you know regenerative agriculture, it really is about like 
you know, encouraging biodiversity, whether it's um, animals or being in together, not in, not separated and stuff, and yep. you know, just allowing the the different grasses to grow, not having monocrops, not having a monoculture, because that's not how nature works. Yes. So it's really about looking at nature and how does nature work, and learning from nature. Yes. Not destroying nature. Yes. Yes, and then letting nature do its thing to then just grow, like mm-hmm. creating the right conditions. Yes, exactly. Or, you know, to then for whatever it is, the cow or the crop, yeah. to just grow. Yeah. And grow in a way that's like healthy and actually nutritious, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And la- allowing cows to eat grass, not feed in grain because the grass has been mowed down or they're waiting for the new crops, you know. The, the, yeah, there's – the you know, regenerative farming – when you when you're sort of transitioning from conventional to region, it's sort of a knowing that you're gonna lose you're gonna lose money at, along that sort of when you're doing that changeover. It take takes a while to get the the land like a drug addict, right? It takes yes. the it takes a while for a drug addict's body to recover after it's been, you know, smashed with yeah. chemicals and drugs. It's yes. the same with the land. Like the land doesn't just suddenly recover. It recovers pretty quickly, but it. The, the the soil has to get that has to get the microbiome back, and then start to function, and then it will like you know you know it will do its thing. Yes, and then it's kind of there's a nickname for it called like the lazy farming because once it's at that point, nature's nature takes over. Mm. I mean, farmers still have to work their ass off. Like, yes. don't get me wrong. I spoke to <laughs> yes. one of our farmers the other day that we sourced from. Oh my god, he's like up at five o'clock this morning. Then I didn't talk talk to me about his day, and he's like, and then I was in bed by twelve, and then I was up at four o'clock wow. this morning. Isn't it amazing? They're so <clears throat> they, farmers are so integral, obviously, to everyone's life. Yeah, yeah. It's just or it's just so in the background, yeah. and ninety eight percent of the people would not even think about mm. where their food comes from. I think that's that's kind of the problem right is mm. that we just don't we, we're so removed from how our food gets on our plate yes we, we just live in a time where we can it's such a convenient time where we walk into a supermarket and there is everything yes there yep. for us and if something's out we're like mm-hmm. why isn't it yeah. there? <laughs> like it's and the pros you know and to get that there you know and to get it made that cheaply like the problem you know, obviously we have to feed the masses. We've got billions of people that we have to feed and food has to be cheap in order to feed. And I'm just about to go into another thing that I'll stay on the track. <laughs> we'll be here forever. <laughs> so, yes, but food food has been made incredibly cheap for us these days. And so when something, you know, when something okay, like organic, mm. you know, is more expensive – it's suddenly like, why is it that people can get so angry about it? Like, how how can food be that expensive? And it's like, well, hang on a second. My perspective is, why is food so cheap? Yes. What, is, what has happened in order to make that that cheap? That's scary to me. Yeah. Like, what has happened to the to the environment? What has happened to the land that's that it's grown on? What has happened to the animal? Like, when you can get, like, you can get a ten dollar chicken. Less even now. That's free range. Yeah, but what I mean, what does that mean? Nothing. It's not free range. They have like but, thirty centimeters instead of yeah, two. It's just, you know, if people could see what they think what free range really is, it is not the past raised bird that they have in their mind. Yeah. But anyway, you know, for that to have happened, it's just you know you you dread to think what the life that that chicken has had, and then what it's been fed, and then what's been you know what's happened to the land in order to grow that feed yeah. and feed the animal that. Yes, yeah. So I, I'm always – our business has evolved quite a lot. We're not that – we're not, you know, that what we were, which was taking an animal off a regen farm and selling it to customers where, you know, we've evolved into a ready meals business that prioritises land ecology, animal welfare and human health. But we often get the question, why are your meals so expensive? And I'm like – Really glad you asked me this question because, <laughs> yeah, you know, my whole thing is like, mate, if you only knew, like, if you only knew what it, what what happens to get your meals to get the other meals so cheap, like, there's meals for three dollars in Woolworths, which is insane because that's also with a markup. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Like huh. you do actually don't want to think about then. Yeah. 
you know, but we should. We should yeah, think oh about yes, it. Of course. But yeah, you don't want to think about it. But we should be thinking about it because it's so bad. Yeah. Like, but the car, but but the consumer doesn't know. They don't know. They're no. just being. They're just being shown a pretty picture. Yeah. On a you know, or told that it's something when it's not. There's a lot mm. of greenwashing that goes on. People want to do the right thing. Yes. You know. But I think that's what's really good. Like because I've seen when you've kind of explained. I guess you know. When people say oh, your meals are so expensive, etc., you'll actually address it and then kind of educate. Mm. And I think that's so important because, you know, when there's food that's more expensive in inverted mm. commas and stuff that's super cheap, mm. people don't like you said. People don't know. So to actually yeah. address it and say, well, this is why. Mm. Is yeah, so I, I, I never have a problem talking about that and 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 look most of our customers like that doesn't ever come up with them they yeah. get it because they shop organically or they yes. they understand and they know that they're going to be paying more money for that type of food but um you know the funny thing is is like when some people say it and they say it angrily and I'm like this isn't a get rich scheme like if I wanted to get rich trust me I would be making my my meals a lot cheaper yes. because then I've got a h- way more of a market yes. to sell them to. Yeah. But yes. right now I know that there's only a certain amount of people who can afford to buy that, and it sucks. Mm-hmm. It sucks. But you know, it's also this huge. It's like what, what we think food should cost these days is like it shouldn't cost that. It no. shouldn't be that cheap. And so there's this massive sort of disparity between f- real food, food that's grown. You know with the land in mind and with the animals in mind, in mind, you know, compared to the other food where people are cutting corners a lot to get their prices down mm. so that they can be in those big supermarkets. And mm-hmm. so... Well, it's, yeah, it's sort of like fashion as well, you know. We're so used to being able to buy a T-shirt for $3 or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. so when a T-shirt is actually... <laughs> made by some, you know, an adult rather than a child and not yeah. super shit fabric yeah. and it's... Know, yeah, whatever. Like, 60 how or dare 80. a t-shirt yeah. cost that much. But it's actually just because we've gotten so used to it being like just ridiculously. Yeah, I mean, cheap. I'm sure that there are there is there's also the other side of you know fashion or whatever where people are, are going. No, I just want to put a premium on this. I'm going to call mm, mine a premium yes. product and charge a lot of money for it, and it's still made the same way. Yes, but I think that is really important about and what's good about Instagram and social media is that you can really understand. You know, and you can trust a business more. And that's why where I'm on my socials a lot because I, it's really important to me that our customers know what our values are and that they come from us and that we're the people who are behind our business and doing everything. Yes. But that's, yeah, that's key as well because especially when it comes to food, I mean, so many businesses, but let's say food, if you go to Woolworths or Coles or, you know, like bigger places, Mm. that's where you're buying your food. There's no relationship mm. where you're getting the food, whereas because people, when people buy from you guys, they know it's you guys and it's yeah. family, and yeah. and that completely changes. I think yeah. that changes everything mm. because then if people have questions, they can mm. ask you. Mm-hmm. They know that you're actually making it, so that relationship is actually fundamental to mm. all sorts of change. I think, and that's what's good about like the like. I love that now, well, I don't know if it's on, probably not on other people's Instagram feed, but my Instagram feed is filled with farmers, <laughs> like young, yes, cool, yeah. hot farmers <laughs> who are like really into regenerating the land yes. and like doing cool things. And they look like they've just walked out of, you know, Marrickville or like, I don't know, like a like modelling thing. Like, you know, like. just, they just, it's just, it's farming has become cool. Mm. And I mean, I guess, I guess there's a huge movement towards like, you know, doing right by the environment. And so anyway, but the good thing is, is that now you can really see, um, you can really meet your farmer, even though you're not meeting them in person, you can follow a farmer's Instagram and you can learn from them and you can see how they're, how they're helping the land or how, what their relationship is with the animals. And you can order direct from them, Mm. like all the, all the not all of them, we only have a handful of people, that farmers that we source from. But, you know, they're on Instagram. I found them on Instagram. and then oh, really? made Well, some I found and some I, you know, when we were doing our region, our region butchery, I was Googling and then we'd visit them and yes. made relationships with them that way and we've kept the ones that we can keep 
to make our food with. We've kept them. Um, but, yeah, they're on Instagram. Yeah. Showing everyone what they're doing and, like, going, like, oh, this happened today. And <laughs> Yes. But, that yeah, that then keeps people connected to their food source. Mm. Because, and the like money goes straight see, yeah. back to the farmer as well. Yeah. It's not, you know, gosh, there's a lot of logistics from getting a, from getting a cow to your plate. There is so many different, you know, hands that that goes, like parts of the chain that that goes right. down. It's very hard to actually, like it was a bull lake the first time we tried to work out, oh, God, how, how do we, can we want to eat that animal, but how do we get that to our plate? Like right. it's a hard thing to work out. Yes. Is that why, <clears throat> is that one of the reasons you stopped doing the butch, like the butchery side of it and went to? No, no. we literally stopped the butchery side because we just could not make money from it. Yeah, right. And about a year and a half into the business when we put so much of our own money into propping it up and constantly kind of going, you know, like maybe it's just a case of, you know, more people knowing about the business. It was actually just we got this woman in to help us with our, just help us with our workout, our costings. Mm. And she was like, "Mm, yeah, (laughs) you guys are not going to be making money (laughs) anytime soon. And I was like, you know, we started this and I was like, I don't care. Don't even want to make money. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then doing it because I, you know, I want that on my plate and other people do. And, you know, it's a movement. I'm all about it. Far out. A year and a half into it, you know, you're exhausted and you're not making any money. You need to make money yes. to run a business, yes. to make a yeah. business work. Like yep. you can't just keep, can't be a passion project. And, and, I, and we were doing, like we were working on it all the time. It's not like we were, you know, I'd sort of st- really stepped away from the industry, the film industry. And so, no, we pivoted the business. We went to the, we went to visit Scott's family in the UK at Christmas time. And there's a supermarket there. I always have to ask Scott, what's that supermarket? It's, um, but it's, it's a good supermarket. And you get the sense when you're in there that they care about where they source their, it's sort of, as opposed to like kind of pretending that they do, you really know, like you know that they're sourcing animal produce from farms. You can get regenerative meat there. You can get organic. Then the ready meals there were like not sort of just single serve plastic, just endless plastic row of kind of ready meals. There was yes. beautiful ready meals that were served in like um, bamboo containers. They looked great. And we had some because we were doing the ready meals already because we were trying to get rid of parts of the animal that don't fly out the door, like the chuck and the mint. So we'd started doing ready meals and selling them at markets, as you know. Yeah. But for the people listening, they don't know that. <laughs> and so, and they were doing really well and we were getting good feedback from them. And so we started to sort of, when we were there, we were like, oh, maybe, maybe we need to pivot the business because there really isn't, that wasn't really being done. There was no. some, there's some very well-known ready meal companies here. But as far as I knew... There wasn't one that was doing, that was prioritizing ingredients, like, you know, really going, we are going to source animal produce from small family owned farms that are doing right by the animals in the land. And we're going to use organic ingredients. Um, and so we just, we kept our values and the philosophy of the business. And we went, okay, well, we're going to source from, we were able to find a wholesaler who was doing what we were doing. But we, they were doing it way better. Yeah. <laughs> they were doing it much bigger. And they also process all the animals on the farms. So none of the animals go to the abattoir. Oh, and that, yeah, that's a big yeah. middleman step, right? So to be able to cut that out yeah. is a big thing. And also it's just, it's quite stressful for animals to take that trip to go to the abattoir. You can't, and most of the time you can't avoid that. But it was great that we were like, oh, cool. Well, that's, that's even better. And so we were able to stop buying whole animals, which was what was costing so much because I don't know if any – at that point in time, it was $4,000 to buy a cow. Yeah, wow. That's a lot of money. Yes. When, when you get six eye fillets on it. Yeah, yes. Wow. And then you're left with the rest of the cow. And half of that cow goes straight away. You get rid of the head. You get rid of the hooves. You get rid of the, you know, yes. get rid of the bones. Like a lot of that's – why, that's why butchers can't do it. Yes. It's just – it's economically, it's really hard. Yeah. So <clears throat> there is a feather and bone, they do it. They're really good. Anyway, so we pivoted the business in February and we've never looked back. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a game changer for the business and people like people love the meals. They love they they love knowing where them you know, where the ingredients are coming from. Yes. 
They love, I mean, I, I love eating a meal where I'm like, man, I'm so happy yeah. that this meal is not only good for me, but good for the land and good for the animals. Yeah. Like it just, like I cannot eat chicken anywhere. Like I can't eat chicken from a restaurant because I, I'm so scared. I still have those images in my, my mind. And I think it's, it's also showing that you can have convenience, but it doesn't have to be this yuck, like you said, like in a plastic thing. Yeah. Feels very like mass made. Yes. And what you guys do is such a nice in between of like, you're not doing it yourself. Yeah. But you know, like you said, where that ingredients come from, but also mm. the people it's come from is mm. whole and not kind of this mm. big industrial just yuck yeah. thing. And I yeah. think you can a hundred percent taste it. Yeah. And the feeling of eating it is totally different. Mm. It feels like a like a proper home cooked yeah. meal. It doesn't feel like you just peeled the plastic off something yes. and then yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You mentioned before with Regen Ag, like how Regen Ag is about like working with nature, kind of healing the land, making sure the land's healthy. What do you think about the link between kind of how we farm and the health of our land and then the health of people? People. Because there seems like such a strong correlation between those two things. Yeah. I don't have any statistics that I can pull out of my head. My mum... I mean, there's lots, there's sort of two, I sort of think that it's a no-brainer. Like yeah. <laughs> pouring chemicals onto your land that grows the food you eat and you eat it, like duh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be as good for you as food that's grown without those chemicals. For me, that's just such an obvious thing. Yes. I don't really need science to tell me whether it is or it isn't. No. <laughs> like I think that's common sense. Yes. But there will be people who tell you that there's no like there's people who say organic produce, organically grown food is no better for you than non-organically grown food. And then there's the other side of it, which is, you know, people who have done research on it and say, say that it absolutely does. It absolutely is better for you. Mum went, my mum, who's big into Regen, as I mentioned, she'd converted the farm from conventional to Regen and made Rachel's farm, which maybe some of these listeners have seen, maybe they haven't. It's on, what's that doc? Anyway, Google it. You'll probably be able to watch it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, she went to a regen convention the other day in WA and the statistics there, there was a whole bunch of people talking about regen, very inspiring. She came back very inspired. <laughs> and she said um, that I'm going to really, this is going to be so, so far from from accurate. But basically the point was she was like the nutrients that are in our, that is in our animal produce now versus what it was, you know, 20, 50 years ago is like chalk and cheese. Yes. Like you just, we are not getting the nutrients in our meat that we were when we were farming without all of the chemicals that are, you know, without what we're doing now to grow crops and feed animals. Yeah. I actually said, she's like, I've got great statistics for you. And I was like, great, send them through. And she sent back like these really blurry photos of, oh, classic. of, of like, the screen. Of a projection <laughs> of the screen really far away <laughs> with like the, you know, things on it. But then I was like, Mum, where's the reference? And she was like, It's there. And I was like, I can't read that, Mum. Is that all you got? Is that what you got? You didn't bring like she was like, Oh, I thought that was all you needed. I was like, No. If I put that up, there's going to be someone yeah. who's like, where's your reference? Yes. <laughs> so I just don't bother. Yes. it's That's hard because, like, <laughs> like, there's a balance between, like, having the references and the science. Mm. This is across many different things, but say mm. food, like mm. reference and science to back things up. But then there's also just, like, just think about it. Like, if you're, if you're pouring or spraying glyphosate or whatever chemical across what you're eating... Mm. You wouldn't do that to like the salad on your plate. No. So and just also like, think about it. Slightly slight slight segue. But you know, well, I, I went and saw um Into the Weeds. Did you, you oh, were there? Were you there? No, no I Dave, think was, Dave there. was there, yeah. Um about glyphosate and about um how that you know, it's it's very good it's a very interesting film about about a farmer who was basically, you know, took Roundup Monsanto, the company, to court because just he, he got cancer. <laughs> from basically being spraying glyphosate everywhere. Anyway, I went and, and, and looked at it because it's 
Roundup is, you know, it's sold at Bunnings and Minor 10. It's used on a lot of playgrounds. Yes. It's used on a lot of people get rid of their weeds. It's used on the side of the road. Like if you drive along a, if you drive along a freeway and there's like a, you know, one of those things in the middle and it's got trees and stuff on it, often there'll be like a brown mark along there. And that's, I don't even know. Scott and I were driving along the other. Why would you bother? We're <laughs> yes. on a freeway. Yeah. So who cares if there's some weeds yes. growing along there? Why do you need to spray it? Why does it need to look all neat? Just let it be. But anyway, I looked at I looked at the handbook that, mm. and I read the the handbook like the and the instructions for it. And it's like make sure your face is covered. Wear gloves. Like the it's like um fourteen pages long. What oh, you wow. should do to and if you get it in your eye and if you get it on your skin. Um, I was quite amazed like I was like I can't believe obviously no one googles this no so no one knows no um but but even to just kind of go oh, okay yeah right wear gloves cover my mouth and nose <laughs> yeah I should be doing all those things but I'll spray it on my garden yeah it's like we, we, we just aren't making that connection anymore no. we're not asking those questions why would I need to cover my face up? Why would all my skin need to be covered before I use this? Yeah. Is it, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's with glyphosate, but it's also like technically you shouldn't put it in the bin or you're supposed to dispose of it in like a, I don't know, the way you dispose of chemicals right, or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, all of these things, but then not thinking about that that's sprayed on food that we then eat. Mm. Yeah. It's so hard to, and you can't control everything, obviously. But it's just, yeah, it's used across so many different. There are um, communities that are banned it, mm. like very few, yes. but you can totally, you know, ban the use of glyphosate mm. in communities. It's just that people don't know it's being used. Yes. You know? And then what the health implications are. Yeah, you know? or what, exactly. So it's a, you know, also I think... You know, there's a lot to also, there's a lot to be said about, you know, we want, I don't, you know, I don't like that it's sprayed on playgrounds and, you know, in sides of street where people walk and stuff like that. But at the same time, I've been in a, the position where I've stressed hard on stuff like that. And that's potentially worse 100%, for me. hundred percent, yes. Than, you know, I think educating and understanding stuff is really important, but becoming obsessive about something is not good for your health. No, I, I, 100%. There's a balance of <clears throat> doing what you can. Yeah. But number one, realising like how resilient the human body is. Mm -hmm. And I think, like you said, the more, if you can want to control everything, that's, that's actually not good for your health mm. either. Yeah. You know, so it's just... Doing what you can, kind of what you were saying yesterday, I think about like ideology mm. and people becoming, it's so black and white or all, yeah. all or nothing. Yeah. But that's just not the reality of mm. life or the way things mm. work. Mm. I think that's across so many things, but particularly diet. Yeah. Well, I've been, like when I was vegan, I basically became vegan, it coincided with the the weekend that I watched a bunch of those documentaries <laughs> yeah. was kind of at the this point in my in my life where I was basically had an eating disorder. Oh. I was so militant about what I put into my mouth. I counted every calorie. I ran five Ks every day without like if I didn't, the stress that went on in my head. Like it was not, I was not in a good headspace yeah. or because, you know, I wanted to look good on camera. Like it was all, that's why I love not being really in the film industry anymore because I'm like, <laughs> I was meant to be in food. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I just love that I don't have that stress on me anymore. But yeah, it, it, yeah I've, been in, I've been in that. It's mm -hmm. been an ideology for me. It's yes. been like those sorts of like being that militant about something whether it's food or whether it's, you know, your beliefs or what you think is going on in the world, I just, and I just can't, that is just not a way of life for me. No. To be that, to care so much that I stop living. Yes. Or that I become a nightmare to be around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I was when I was that militant with food. I was not a fun person to be around. So I think, like, for me, I just know there's a sweet spot. 
Yeah. There's like, I can care, but I know where caring like gets tipped into a point where I start to like be anxious mm. and that's not good for me. That's not good for my children. No. So I think you can move the needle without being so vehemently attached to your beliefs. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Two things. I think what you said about you're then not living mm. is huge because you're so consumed by what you believe. Mm. But also on, what, on that, what you believe, or for me, what I believe can change. So I was vegan, <laughs> similar, mm. watched a few, mm. some documentaries and yeah. read all these books and started learning about it and was vegan for probably five years. Yeah. And I'm not now. Mm. So my beliefs around that has, have, have changed. Mm. So when we get so, mm. and I feel much more now, I have my beliefs, but I'm not so attached to them, mm. you know, and I don't identify mm. with my beliefs so mm. much. It's just what I mm. believe and what I think. Mm. But it's very easy to get attached and identify with, mm. you know, a diet or mm. whatever it is. Mm. And then if that changes, it can be a bit of a like, ooh, yeah. not who am I, but, you know, like a bit of a harder to let go of yeah, because it's been your identity. Mm. Yeah, I also think like it's it's not a nice place to be in because it makes you so judgmental. Yes. And, yeah. you know, like, oh, man, I was so judgy when I was vegan. The same. <laughs> That person at the dinner table who was just, give me the chance yeah. and I'll tell you yes. why you should be vegan. Yeah. <laughs> Nightmare. <Same. laughs> and I don't, I don't judge people about what they believe or what they do or what they put into their mouths. Like that's their thing. Yeah. And all we try to do is to express what we're learning mm. like in, and often try and break down something that's a little bit hard, harder for people to understand if they're not in that world to try and understand it in a really simple way mm. um, and to stay authentic during that, like not to ever, you know, be like, oh, we only eat organic meat. We only eat, you know, regen. We only buy from organic shops. Like that's, you know, like, mate, you'll see me in Woolworths for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes. I, but we also – we also prioritise, like that's what we've chosen to prioritise. That's what we've chosen to spend the majority of our money on yes. is is our food. Yeah. And because of that we make sacrifices elsewhere. We rarely go out to dinner because Scott cooks so well that every time I go out to dinner I'm like, your steak would have been way better than this with your sauce yes. of her day. <laughs> but, you know, we all have to make sacrifices somewhere unless you've got an endless pit of money. Yeah which majority of people don't have. Mm -hmm. And so it's just about where you choose to, what you choose to prioritise. So, yeah, I mean, we do that really, that is important to us. You won't find me in a supermarket that much, but, but, you know, it's not to say that I don't go in them. Yeah. You know, it's not to say I, I don't need something from the supermarket. I'm not, you know, like I said in that post that you're referring to, I, I'm not, I never, ever want our platform to be preachy, elitist, lectury yeah. it's it's more of like a space of like this is the this is the area that we're in and we're learning to and I want to share the things that we're learning when you're kind of yeah judgy or don't have that maybe like flexibility or whatever you then just like separate yourself Alienate from everyone people. else yeah. exactly and it's just the same as like you know being carnivore or being a mm. vegan mm. you're just thinking you're in your little tribe totally. without any kind of yeah. openness or like collaboration with what other people are doing. Yeah. You just get become so close, close minded. Yeah. It's almost like, <laughs> I feel like pe often people who are so attached to the ideo their ideologies or their beliefs start off with this thing of like, I'm so open minded. That's yeah. why I believe yes. this. And then I just see them become so close minded. It's like they will not open the door to any other thing or possibility, or anything. It's like, no, this is my beliefs. You're not going to challenge them. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like we've well, stopped. you now stopped just being a curious human being. Yes. You've yes. stopped asking questions now. Like now you just think you're right and everyone else is wrong, and there's just no way that that's the case. Mm. Like we, 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 I just don't think, <laughs> I don't think there's any truth out there. No. No. And so – we should always be open to, some, you know, a possibility of, oh, 
That's, even if that's wrong, that's really interesting. Yes. Even if that's your belief, like that's like from a human perspective, that's just how did you get there? Yeah. You know, not like, yeah. I, yes. And yes. And if you believe something different, that doesn't have to then like challenge my, I, I mean, yes. it can, but that doesn't mean that what I think is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's this weird, like, yeah, well, if we I just, think something different, then, oh my God, then you're wrong. And, like, you know, <laughs> we can't be friends. <laughs> yeah. No, it I know we exist like in that. this world now, and especially on sort of social media, you see it so much of these attacks. Yes. Like, it's scary sometimes to put up something because, mm. you know, like, you worry that you're going to get attacked by someone who doesn't believe what you've put up you know, what you've said. Yeah. And instead of, you know, it just wouldn't happen in the real world. They wouldn't come up to you and yell at your face. Yes. You know, you you might get there eventually, but it doesn't conversation. They don't really start. Like we've lost this ability to just be, to have a difference of opinion mm-hmm. and for it to be okay. Yes. Yeah. And the curiosity thing. So, because why do you think that, or, you know, yeah, just having a conversation out of curiosity, not to mm. prove that I'm right. To prove that I'm right. And I just think, whatever, 90% of the time, even if people have two opposing views, the reason they have those views are coming from the same place. Be Mm. it, you know, like Mm, if you're a carnivore, you're making that decision because you think it's best for your health. Mm. If you're a vegan, you're making that decision because you think it's best for you. So the foundation of why people are making decisions is often the same. Mm. It's just that it's like directed to be right. Like, I want yeah. my version of it to be right. Yeah. And so I'll argue about it until it's like, and also, it might be right for you. Exactly. And this day and age, honestly, I think you could probably prove, in inverted commas, like with papers and scientific research and stuff, literally every person's opinion. Yeah. Because there's just different studies yeah. for whatever, you know, yeah. different outcomes. Yeah. So, like, there is, like you said, there is no truth there's no one ultimate truth mm. everyone just has a different mm. story version and story yeah. yeah and that's really hard i think it's very to hard navigate. to navigate because you can really get on board and i also feel like we live in this kind of era where everyone there's so much information and maybe people feel a little bit like inadequate if they don't have something that they're you know that they understand or that they're sort of fighting for yes and so it's almost like, I don't know, no one wants to just be like, yeah, do you know what? Like I choose to, I'm just, I can't fit any more information into my head. So I don't have an opinion on that. Yes. Sorry. I'm just not yes. even going to weigh in on this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just be like, I, I honestly don't know. Mm. You know? Yeah. Like, I, exactly. I don't know. <laughs> like the chemtrail thing, right? Yes. This is an interesting one because I don't know. Yes. Like the, I've read of both. Yes. It's either condensation trails or it's chemtrails. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. There is very convincing arguments on both sides, right? Yeah. You know, I've got some friends who def- they're, they're definitely it's condensation, it's not chemtrails, and I've got other friends who are like, it's definitely chemtrails. And, you know, and I was walking with a friend the other day and she looked up in the sky and she was like, what do you think, chemtrails? And I was like, oh, I don't care. Sorry, I just don't care. What am I going to do? Yeah. Am I going to move? Yeah. Like, am I really, am I going to, oh my God, there's people, there's chemtrails over my area in the world. Well, apparently they're everywhere. Yeah. So what am I actually going to do about that? Am I just going to suddenly now feel fear? Yes. Because now there's chemtrails. Yeah. And what, and then what am I going to do with that fear? Mm. I'm just going to go and pass that on to other people. Yeah. I'm going to go, I can look at that. Chemtrails. Yeah. What do you what do you think that is? What are you going to do about it? It's like that's the thing that I have the problem with the most about all this stuff is like regardless of what is right feeds fear. Uh-huh, yes. Like it's just propagating fear. Yeah. And what do you do with that? Are you actively out there? Are you standing on the corner with a sign saying, you know, I'm fighting for no chemtrails? Or are you just going chemtrails? Yes. Look, well, it's look just, what do you yeah. think about that? Hmm? <laughs> yes. Now you've got the fear. Yeah. It is a little bit of a scary time to live and you don't know when you're going to, like that, for example, you know, no doubt there's someone listening to that who's like, oh, I know what they are. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, and is angry now <laughs> <laughs> because I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and but the, by not caring, you're detaching yourself from this 
thing, whatever yeah. it is, which is almost more empowering because well, I just I'm just like I'm just you. a human being. Yeah. Like there's only so much I can do. Yes, like I'm doing what I can. Yeah, in the little way that I can, which is the good farm shop. Yeah, and right now I am not going to go down a, a rabbit hole on what they are because I'll feel the need to fight. Yes. Like I'll feel the need to do something about it. That's actually a lot of the time why I I choose what I, I – I'm very careful about what I choose to listen to because I'm am quite a sensitive person. I think a lot of people in the world are and so that's that's where a lot of the closeness comes from is that people don't – they're too scared because there's not a lot you can do as a – you know, as an – as an individual, as a human, as a family, yeah, there's not a lot you can do with these things, yeah, and so it's very disempowering, and it's very that's very scary, and that's, you know, that's where, for me, it's like I can only, I can only control what I can control, and these are the things I'm choosing to put my time and energy into, and these are the things I'm choosing to, I'm not closed off to any of it, I'm happy to to, but I'm not going to go and uproot my life or stand on a corner with a you know, or or go and start a, you know, so I'm not going to, so I'm not going to put that into my body, that yes. fear into my body. Yeah. And that takes you out of the real world, like the real world. During COVID, you know, yeah, I was, would read a lot of mm. shit, either the news or like whatever, mm. not the news. I was checking the news 400 times a day, yeah. <laughs> you know, like was very in that yeah. bubble as most people were. Yeah. And now... I check the news maybe a handful of times a week. Mm. You know, I don't check it every day because for me mm. personally, that doesn't mean that checking the news every day is bad. But mm. for me personally, I was like what I'm reading and what I'm yeah, seeing is dictating then how I see the world. Yeah. But that's actually not true. No. You know, I, when I was reading the news, I was like, oh, God, the world is like this crazy, scary, mm. terrible place. Mm. And when I had that distance, I was like, the world's actually really good and people are fundamentally really yeah. beautiful and good, I yeah. think. Yeah. Bad stuff just happens sometimes. Yeah. You know? So it was this really just like mm. not letting yeah, what you read or consume then dictate how you mm. see and interact with the world and people. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I I think you can I'm the same. Like if I if I, if I read something I can really notice the effect that it has mm. on my mental state. Like I suddenly, I mean, my God, you know, wow, yeah. well, it's fucked up. Like I got hacked the other day on Instagram <laughs> and it was like, I couldn't, this humanity was like, <laughs> shit. I can't believe there are people out there who do this. Yes. And my headspace for the whole day was just like, what's the world we're living in? Mm. And, you know, got my got my Instagram back. <laughs> Everything's good. Everything's fine. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thought about it two days later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I wanted to talk to you about, like, motherhood. What do you think of, like, motherhood in this day and age, I guess, and your experience with being a mum? I think there's a lot of pressure on mums. Mm. And I think this comes back to, like, social media as well. I feel, like, I love, love motherhood. Mm. Wouldn't change it for the world. But I do feel like there is a lot of, well, I guess that for me it becomes I I get the mum guilt when I go on Instagram and see, like, Instagrams that are just dedicated to, like, you know, that it'll be someone who is a food, you know, someone who's, like, helping to educate people on what to feed your kids or something. But on their Instagram it's just, like, amazing food that they feed their kids. Yes. Or, like... You know, another one where it's just people who are in, they, the kids just never have Vegemite on their clothes or, like, they're always, the house is always tidy. Yes. <laughs> and and I off, and I sort of think, like, oh, my God, I'm a shit mum. I, I think I don't have, I haven't worked it out mm. if there is something to work out. Like, yeah. I find it really hard. Yes. But I don't mind that. Like, I don't, I've gotten to the realisation most days where I'm like, my kids are very loved. Yeah. Like there's no question that my kids don't know that they're the most important thing in the world. Like the amount of times I tell them I love them, yeah. like the amount of times I smush them with kisses and like jump on the trampoline with them all, like dude, take them to the playground, or like whatever. 
I know that that's the most important thing. Yeah. And that, like, I've just, I've gotten a little bit less hard on myself. Mm. Only really in the last couple of months. Yeah, right. And partly that is because of a doctor I went to see. Do you know Matt Burke? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I went to see Matt Burke for like a whole lot of kind of reasons. I had this pain down my leg that wouldn't go away. It was just no one knew what it was. I had, I was really tired. I thought all this was motherhood. Like yes. I was like, of course, I'm just, I'm just so tired because I've got two small kids and I'm got achy limbs because I've got two small kids and My I'm, <laughs> I'm basically just a wreck because I've got two small kids. And anyway, you know, I went into him and sort of said the things that had been going on and um, he was like, you shouldn't be feeling this way you, you, just because you've got two small kids. Because I, I actually went to him because I was like, oh, God, Zan said to me the other day at like three o'clock in the afternoon, he was like, let's go down to the beach. And in my mind, I couldn't fathom. Mm. I couldn't fathom getting them down to the beach and getting them back. Like to get to the beach, we have to walk. It's not far. We're lucky where we live. But it was like a walk. I sort of didn't want to drive. It's kind of too close to, yes. to drive. It's better to walk. But it's hard to walk and then come up the hill. And in my mind, I was like, I really want to take them to the beach. I really want to be a good mom, and like it'd be nice to go to the beach. But I couldn't get my body to do it. And I had that during a nook's my pregnancy with a nook. I had hypothyroidism and I had really low iron. So I've it was like a the feeling where I would want to go and do something, and I, my body was just like, you can't, yes. you can't do that. You're so tired, you can't leave the couch. I felt really struggled with my energy, and it sort of start, had started happening again. But I just thought it was just. Anyway, it was emotional. Most of it was emotional. Yeah. I mean, I still had like a low-level hypothyroidism that I hadn't checked since I gave birth to her basically and then I went off the pills that I was on and I just didn't get it checked again. Right. Yes. I was like, it'll sort itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it sort of did but it sort of didn't. And then I also have this MTHFR gene which I didn't, I didn't know that I had, which when you're – I only have it from one parent, but basically it was an answer to a lot of the problems that I'd been having. And so we did a lot of work around that. Lots of them were just sort of, and and adrenal fatigue. Mm. And, but the main thing was just this leg pain and also this sort of stuff that was coming up around motherhood, around being like mother guilt and getting really emotional at certain things and, and then feeling like or, or losing my temper with them and feeling terrible for days, you know. Yes. And anyway, I went to him and he, he does like he's a Cairo, a doctor of Cairo, but he also does the – he's an amazing kinesiologist. Right. So, he you know, he puts the vials into your hands and tell you what you should should and shouldn't be eating. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, I, I should not eat gluten and I don't now. Yeah. But I was having massive reactions to gluten. It was like the first thing to go. And then he did, he does like after a few of those sessions, he goes, okay, well, let's work on some emotional stuff now. And he does like, it asks your body, you know, is it family related, friend related, blah, blah. Your body tells him everything. Yes. Um, what age, did this, you know, what, what age was it? Blah, blah, blah. And it all happens really quickly. Yes. <laughs> Not really even in control of it. You're just, you're letting your body do it. And then he goes, okay, male, family member, what, who comes up? Oh, wow. And you're like, oh. Okay, and then suddenly some someone will come up some for no reason at all. Like there's no problem that you foreseeable thing, but it'll be like, okay, what happened when you were fifteen? You know, and it'll be like my dad or something, right? Yes. And you know, something will come up around. Well, I, I, for that particular, oh my god, <laughs> we really this is gonna. We should end the we should end the podcast here. <laughs> On the cliffhanger. No, 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 no. People will make the wrong assumption. No, basically, for that one, I'd better finish it. For that one, I'd, I'd, my first sexual experience with a, with a, um, when I was a teenager was re, was really public. The thing wasn't public, but it became public. And then I got really shamed. I got like punished. I got, I got really, it got in trouble for it. Right. And so from then on, like my sexual, I've had shame around sexual, sexual spe- sex. Like yes. it's been a real shameful thing in my life. And so he was able to sort of like, you know, then he does this little time tap, 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 tap. And you're like, cry. And then he does, you know, and then he goes, I, it's okay to feel, it's okay to enjoy sex. You know, it's yeah, like he retrains wow. your body so that you, you know, you, anyway, the, he did, that was, re- that wasn't related to my leg <laughs> far out. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, Still a good story. Basically, <laughs> basically, the one that he really helped me with, there was lots he's helped me with, but the specific one around motherhood. Yes. Was that I was really scared I was going to fuck my kid's life up. Yeah. In some way, shape, or form. That inevitably, no matter how hard I tried, I was going to, there was going to be something that they had to find a Matt Burke for yeah. to like get out of them. And this particular one was that, you know, really early on, my mum's, my mum was a model. Really early on, my mum was very strict about what we ate. Yeah. Like, you know, the moment that I put on weight, it was you diet time. And so, that's been my thing for, you know, it's like how, you know, I'll hear my mum's, mu- for a long time I heard my mum's voice come in over anything I ate, like don't eat that, you, you know, that controlling really how I felt about my body. And and so I had been feeling this sort of weirdly, this is how it comes, this is so subconscious, yeah. but some, for some reason that had been kind of coming up and she came up in the session, he was like, you know, 13 family woman, female, who is it? And I was like, you know, immediately it was like, mum. Yeah. And then it comes and then, you know, he says, well, what, what, what's coming up for you? Like, what is it? And I was like, I think it's around like, you know, just how it was her best intention. Mm. She didn't do it out of, because she didn't love me. She thought that was the, you know, that was her best, in, that was her trying to be a good mum. And it really fucked with me. For you know, re- the reason why I was on diets all through my teenage years, it was the reason why I had an eating disorder when I was in my twenties. It was the reason why I looked at myself in the mirror and went, "You're fat," you know. Yes. And so, even though I knew, and I and I wasn't, I gotten past the sort of anger and stuff about it, but I was holding it in me, and I and I was thinking, "I'm gonna fuck my kids up. Yeah. Like I'm gonna do something out of love, and it's gonna end up as trauma." Yes. <laughs> And he was great because he just taps that that out of you. He, yeah. You know, he just does that, and then he says, "You know, basically, he was like, it's uh, like uh, I can't. Really, he has this amazing way of sort of wording things. Like, and it was, I'm o, I'm okay to motherhood. It was like it's okay to, it's okay to feel. You know, a motherhood is hard. Like it's okay yeah. to like I'm it's something that he said, and I, immediately I just started crying. I couldn't even say it because mm. I'm. I, I couldn't, I didn't believe, like it was hard to say the words like, I'm not a fuck up, I'm not a shitty mum, you know, it was hard, yes. like I really had to, I'm a good mum, you know? Yeah. But once you say it and you've sort of got that stuff tapped out of you, like I let go of a lot of stuff. Yeah. And like kind of released that thing of, like, I love my kids, I'm doing the best. Yes, and that's ultimately the main thing, that yeah. children feel loved. And you can't, yeah, as, as you say that, I'm like, I think I have a real thing of, it's like I need to always be there for mm. Andy, which is obviously true. She's mm. too, mm. you know. <laughs> yeah. But like respond to her all the time and blah, blah, blah. And I think that's an overcompensation of mm. not necessarily being responded to in the right way by my own mum. Right, yeah. So it's like they the little kids bring up your own shit mm. and so you then have to – work through that mm. because you either do the same thing or you do the opposite in like too far in yeah. that direction. Yeah. So they're yeah. they're the ultimate like Yeah. You really look at yourself and your own stuff I've found with when you have a child. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I think that's like I think it's really good to care, you know? Yes. It's like that's what makes you a good mum is that you're you want to do the right thing yeah, and that you're upset with yourself or whatever because you haven't in that moment. And so, you know, that comes yes. from ca- being a caring parent. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And you're, you know, it's it's all to hopefully then be, yeah, the best parent that you can be, yeah. which won't be perfect because that does not exist. <laughs> like, and you'll fuck them up if you I've already to be fucked perfect. mine up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I know that there's something I've done. <laughs> yeah, which is like. In 20 years' time, it's going to come up in a therapy session. <laughs> But you just have to, yeah. Just, just try and fuck them up a little less. Less, in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> than if I wasn't a total asshole. Yeah. But even like what you were saying about Matt, I think as well what he, I haven't seen him, but what he does or what doctors like him do mm. is like you can like intellectualise and intellectually like move through something, mm. but yeah. it still lives within in your you. body. And yeah. until that's actually, that's like the final step, I think, of then like 
letting go and releasing mm. things mm. is when it actually moves out of your body. Well, that was what was the most amazing thing was, was that it was this pain that was down my leg. I'm just going to pour some water because I'm getting dry throat. I'd had this ongoing pain down my leg every night, getting worse and worse. And, and like, not, no, I'd been to, I'd had a scan, I'd been to doctors about it. It was just, like, it was a mystery. And he straight away was like, it's emotional. And that's what that, and it literally, I walked out of his, I'm talking months of this pain every night when I went to bed, like waking up hysterical oh, wow. sometimes with the pain, like contractions down my leg. But what, like, and it, it had been, it had only come after motherhood. It only oh, come right. after the kids. I'd never had it before. It had been on and off over the years, but this particular thing, it had just literally gotten to the point where it was like yelling at me. <laughs> it was yes. like, and that's when, then after that session, it didn't come back. Yeah, wow. Gone. He was like, you, I was like, I'm just, just because it's really throbbing right now. Can I take some Panadol? Do you think I could be okay to take Panadol after this session? He was like, you won't need to. Wow. I was like, yeah, we'll see about that. We got in the car, drove home, and it was gone. Isn't that amazing? And I still can't believe it. Yeah, that's, and it sounds like, or it can sound, especially if, you know, you haven't, like, I guess, been to doctors or practitioners who work in that way. Mm. It can sound like quacky, mm. but it's actually legitimate. Mm. And yeah. when you've, like, experienced it yourself. But also, yeah. of course, like, if you're going through something emotional, it will affect your body. Mm. And that could just be feeling tired or, mm. you know. Stressed, like stress stressed. when you hold that. You know what, you, what stress does to your body. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it is. Like. Amazing. Amazing where it shows up as well. Yes, you know? exactly. Like my, yeah, my legs. Like, why did it show up in my legs? Yeah. And it's been fine since then. Been fine. I haven't had I had it in both legs. And I had one cleared from one session, the other ones kept going. So I had like that leg came back to him like the following week. I was like, that leg's fine. This leg hasn't gone away. And he was like, Okay, let's do the work. Yeah, and then did it and then another thing where I was like, How did that come up? Yeah. Like it never would have thought that thing like things that come up, you're like, Oh, that's weird. Okay, cool. But the pain's gone. Yes. But that's <laughs> good. So you feel good now. I feel really good yeah. now. I honestly felt like I, I did a post on my Instagram <clears throat> not not that long before I went to see Matt and I was so exhausted. I was like in the car crying and, you know, candidly wrote about how I was feeling at this point in time as a mum, just wrecked. Yeah. And I do really think that that had a lot to do with what my body was going through and how exhausted I was from these other things. Mm. I am so much more resilient now. So my one piece of advice for mums would be like, don't necessarily just put it down to, oh, I'm tired because I have two small kids. Like just go and seek some kind of, like find a holistic doctor or a kinesiologist or someone that does that. I think it's called EMT. Oh, that really Emotional, is- emotional, there's someone out there going, <laughs> emotional, <blah, blah." laughs> something, that thing. emotional something therapy. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Yeah, to find someone, not just a doctor, but a doctor that does like, you know, looks at your diet that you really trust. They're more expensive, but they're so worth it. Yeah. And get your bloods done because that will bring up stuff like you've got low iron or you don't have enough vitamin D. Like my vitamin D is always low, mm. all that stuff. And, and the other thing he said, that which is so good and has been a really nice ritual for the kids and I is to watch the sun come up every day because my vitamin D is so low. Oh, nice. And never wear sunglasses. Yeah, uh, wow, really? Because I have really – so any time I can get sun into my eyes, it's good for me. Yeah, right. And my skin. And so to watch the sun come up in the morning resets your dopamine levels. Yeah. Like it gives you a really good boost and it's your serotonin or dopamine. I don't know which one he said. Anyway, it's just been really good. Yeah, it's amazing. So don't necessarily like, you know, just put it down to that. Go and do things that you need to do to really make sure that your body and your mind isn't really suffering. Yeah. Hundred percent. Get yourself in for a massage. Yeah, do some self care. Yeah, go to yoga. I've started yoga again for the first oh. time in like ages, and I just cannot believe how I lived without it. It's that time out. Yeah, and, and actually, because for me, I'm so busy. Like you go from chaotic morning to constantly just trying to get enough done in the day for the business, and then you know cleaning the house, doing the washing. There's, and then, you know, getting the kids in a chaos again, feeding them, bath time, like all the things. Like there's no real time to breathe. <laughs> like I spent a lot of the day 
just trying to get through stuff. But when you go into like a yoga studio, because I'm I need to kind of go to a place. I'm not very good at doing it yeah. at home, like religiously. I like the community of a space and walking in and feeling like it's my you know, and doing that like it's it's just it really is like stepping out of all of that and into just enough time to just like breathe, mm, yeah, <laughs> and reset. And then you have so I'm such a better mum. Yes, when I have that time for an hour to breathe and do some stretching, <laughs> like I'm such a way more resilient and able to just yeah yeah. It's like, it really is something powerful about the breath. Mm. I don't I didn't wasn't feeling that when I was going to Pilates, like because I was I was doing last year I was doing Pilates maybe three times a week and I'd leave the house and I'd go and do it, but I wasn't feeling the resilience I would come back and I would still feel like I hadn't stepped out of that I was I was just doing exercises you know goes from one thing to another thing where I'm just it's about the body yes I wasn't getting that breath and that is what I feel like is the like oh I feel like there's so many exercises that are really they change your body but I feel like yoga changes your life it changes you that breath is so important yeah yeah, it's like the stillness that that breath brings. Mm, yeah. And the calm and, the, yeah, the space and the, like, yeah, being back in your body because even sometimes if you go into a Pilates or whatever class, mm. you're moving your body but are you, like, in your body, mm. you know, whereas yoga I feel like you're there much more. It's much more connected. Yeah. Like like meditation. Yeah. Meditation would be the other thing but I'm useless at that. Yeah. Like I try, you know, I'm like, I should meditate. And then I don't because I have Zan crawling all over me or jumping on my back or, you know, yeah. I can't make the time. So yoga is that for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, like you said, it's just knowing what those things are that mm. actually like nourish and replenish you, yeah. you and, yeah, send to you. Mm. And then, yeah, making them a priority when you can. Mm. Yeah. You know? So okay. Well, is that magic. a good place to end? Yes. I think yeah. that people are falling asleep now. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure. It was so good. It was fun. It was really fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. I'll link to all of Till's info in the show notes, like her website, Instagram, the Good Farm Shop details. And I'll also link to her mum, Rachel, her mum, um, her doco, Rachel's Farm. I think it's on Stan. It just got released on Stan, but also a whole bunch of other platforms. So I'll link all of that in the show notes. And yes, please check out the episode if you got something out of it or you think someone you know will enjoy it.